Right, welcome everyone to the uh, Politics and International Relations uh, subject talk for the University of Leicester. Um, I'm Dr Vikram Vasan, I'm the Admissions Tutor for, for Politics and IR um, in the School of History, Politics and IR. I'm also one of the lecturers in, in political theory. So what we're going to be doing with this talk is running through in, in kind of very broad brushstrokes what the politics and IR offering is at the University of Leicester, um, what you can expect to study, and some of the unique selling points that both the department um, and the university might offer to, to prospective students. If you do have any questions um, as they come up through the through the presentation, do just pop them into the uh, the chat and, and we'll address them at the end. Um, and we should have around about 15, 20 minutes to talk about uh, questions and answers. So um, we'll leave plenty of time for that. Right, so I suppose one of the, the big things to answer first before we even start talking about the politics and IR side is, is why Leicester? I mean, it's a fairly um, uh, you know, unique university in the sense that it's it's for its kind of pedigree and its size, it is a campus based university. You often find universities that um, you know have kind of Leicester's uh, profile in, in, in the kind of national um, uh, rankings often being large campus, uh, sorry, large kind of sprawling universities that are spread across the, uh, you know, entire cities and, and have, have a sort of, um, you know, quite overwhelming experience to some students, you know, in the sense that they don't feel they're part of one particular campus where they can always see their lecturer, um, they're near the student union, they're near their lecture theatre, they're near their, um, their, their personal tutor's office and all that kind of stuff. So what I think for me, the really unique selling point of Leicester, particularly having come here in the last year or so, um, is the fact that it's, it's got a really nice community feel where the campus is. It's actually quite a nice leafy campus as well, backing onto Victoria Park, um, and one that's also had a lot of investment in it recently um, as well. So I think if you think about what kind of student you are, you know, what kind of university experience you want, um, if you're someone that would feel, you know, more comfortable as a part of a, a medium sized community where you know your lecturers at face to face level. We all know each other by our first names kind of thing. Uh, Leicester's definitely the, the the type of university for you. It's obviously not the only one that offers that kind of experience, but it's certainly something you should you should seriously look at if that's the type of university experience you you would like. Um, other kind of you know general facts you can see on the uh, PowerPoint there. Ninth most affordable city. Um, it might not be something you're you're thinking about very consciously when choosing a university course, but trust me, when you get to university, you'll you'll notice it. So uh, you know if you don't want to be um, someone who's having to kind of watch your pennies day in day out um, and deciding whether you can go out on a Friday night on Friday night or not. Um, I mean Leicester's a really good place to to have a kind of a, a good student night out. Um, often uh, you know uh, uh, we have a lot of local students who know the area really well as well. Um, so you get kind of uh, good places to go out that are maybe off the beaten path as well, um, which I think is quite nice for people who, who aren't necessarily from the Midlands um, as a way of kind of discovering a university city. Um, 30th in the UK in the in the newest kind of Guardian League table. So, uh, you know, right up there with uh, some of the top Russell Group universities, even though we're not a member of the Russell Group, we're kind of sort of biting at the heels of those universities in terms of our research power, our kind of teaching credentials, um, our international profile in, in publications, citations, um, prestige of our lecturers and that kind of thing as well. So a really, really kind of nice balance of factors there, you know, university that's that's kind of um, hard hitting and heavy hitting when it comes to its research profile and its teaching, but also uh, a nice intimate uh, experience as well, one where you're not going to get lost in a in a kind of sea of, of students. So to actually turn to you know the subject you've you've come to hear about, or the two subjects you've come to hear, hear about, politics and international relations. Um, it's worth noting that you know what often uh, you think politics is on a day-to-day -day basis is is just barely touching the surface of what you're going to be doing at university. So um, I always use this kind of silly example when whenever I have a kind of you know my, I'm having my hair cut or something like that, which is long overdue, um, and someone asks me what I do, and I'm a, I say I'm a lecturer in politics, and then you kind of get a oh, roll of the eyes and like, wow, why do you want to just talk about MPs all day? Uh, and just bang on about a useless prime minister and that kind of thing. And obviously you'll be learning about that. There's a bit of that in you know year one. You're learning about what democracy is. You're learning about what political parties are. You're learning about what pressure groups are. But the way politics as an academic discipline has developed over the last um, really 60, 70 years has gone way beyond that. We're not just talking about kind of parliamentary politics anymore. We're talking about gender politics, the politics of race, global politics, um, the politics of, of ecological disaster, you know, all these really big, important questions that are going to define your futures, really. Um, 
over the next 50 years are absolutely at the core of what studying politics at university is about. Um, so if you have done it for A-level, you may you know, feel familiar with some of the early content, but you'll then get to choose you know, quite interesting, in-depth, sophisticated topics that you might not have come across um, at college level study or on TV for that matter um, already. So there's a, it's a very, very wide field in terms of, of what you can study, and it's not necessarily the kind of um, you know, premise is question time sort of stuff that you see in day out, day in, day out, but you will get some of that um, as well. The other one, that, which I think students often have a, um, a bit more confusion about, is what is international relations? Because we all kind of instinctively know what politics is. Um, IR again has become a much a much broader discipline over the last 60 or 70 years. At its very basic level, what it used to be was basically st you know, studying the relations between states. And, and the reason it was kind of hived off from politics as a discipline is because the assumption was that is that the international sphere is kind of anarchic in the way that a country isn't. I mean, governments come and go in a country, but there's always a kind of order. The civil service is still there. The police force is still there. Um, civil society is still there. The assumption of, of a certain type of international relations was that the international order is anarchic. It's only really states that put order on it. And it's really the big powerful states that do that. So think of the United States, um, think of China, uh, think of the European Union, that kind of thing. Um, so it was kind of seen as slightly distinct from politics because it was de dealing with a slightly different foundation of, of kind of what was going on in the world. Um, the way that's really changed recently is, is in a similar kind of way to politics, it's become more um, inflected with critical ideas. You know, we have a kind of standard idea of what international relations is, but how has it not really kept up with lots of the problems the world faces? So things like refugees, uh, again, things like ecological disaster, how does that feature in international relations? Um, things like international political economy, you know, as the world has got more globalized and the global economy much, much more complex, how have states kind of navigated that? Um, how do smaller states play a role in that given the fact that they have smaller GDPs and that kind of thing. Um, also things to do around, you know, uh, war and peace, violence and non-violence, um, all this kind of good stuff that, that um, really structures how the international system works and how it's changing um, over the over the next few years or the next few decades. Um, so you have an option to either do you know, just politics on its own, just international relations on its own, or politics and international relations as a joint degree where basically your modules are 50-50 between two subject areas. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, that's that's give, leaving your options really wide open for a whole set of careers, whether that's working in charities, NGOs, working for local councils, uh, working for international business. Um, it's a really kind of open ended degree in that sense, um, in terms of skilling you up for the for the workplace. Um, I mean, I kind of touched on this uh, a little bit already, but in addition to kind of, you know, being really in tune with modern um, modern kind of challenges the world faces, um, which do, you know, filter into the world of work as much as kind of the, the academic side of things. Um, you know, if you end up getting a professional postgraduate job, you're going to be working with companies from different parts of the world. You're going to be working with colleagues from different parts of the world. Um, corporations, you know, sooner or later, even the ones that don't consider it on a day to day basis are going to have to deal with ecological disaster and what that means for their business, um, potential political instability that's, you know, has, has kind of swept across uh, the Western world in the last uh, five or six years. You know, what does that mean for business and all that kind of stuff? So these are all things that, you know, really fe uh, feature directly in, in thinking about the world of work, but also, you know, hard skills as well. So it's not just the content of politics and international relations, but independent work skills. You'll be doing a lot of independent research as a part of um, this BA degree. You'll be, uh, you know, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, condensing it into understandable terms for class and then sharing it with me, sharing it with other lecturers, sharing it with your classmates. So you're developing all these sorts of skills that you'll probably have to do at some point in a professional career. Um, you know, uh, doing your own research, analysing data, communicating it to your colleagues, trying to put a memo together for your boss about how best to sort of change business practices and, and so on. These are all the kinds of hard skills that politics and IR um, at university level deals with both at the level of kind of qualitative analysis, so that's looking at text, um, and even some quantitative analysis on the political science side. So looking at, you know, polling data uh, and that kind of stuff. So there's a little bit of numbers in there. It doesn't require any particular expertise, so you don't have to have an A-level in maths for it, but at least you're having a flavour of, of that kind of thing, um, which, you know, employers obviously um, like to see. Um, and then, you know, the, the critical evaluation skills, which for me is always the most important thing as an academic, that, that we're not trying to sort of 
give you a concrete answer of what you should think at university. The point is you come to university with all sorts of set ideas and assumptions. We provide you with the critical concepts, the critical skills to try and deconstruct what you think. Um, and then if you leave, you know, kind of reinforcing the ideas you came with, fine, but at least you've got the evaluative skills to say, this is why I think what I think, not just this is what I think. Um, so that, of course, is important in the world of work as well. Whether you end up doing something creative or something business oriented, um, or something that's very public facing, you know, being able to bring those critical skills to day-to-day to -day problem solving uh, is really, really important as well. Uh, so politics and IR at Leicester specifically has a really long history. I mean, it goes all the way back to the 1940s um, when politics was first taught at Leicester. So uh, a really long pedigree, um, a lot of kind of long standing research interests as well. So uh, democratic theory uh, has been um, at one time or, or another a big, a big subject at Leicester. Uh, recently, um, animal rights has become a big subject at Leicester. And we've had a number of specialists, quite prominent specialists at the university who work on that. Um, at the moment, kind of studies in with parliamentary studies and all that kind of stuff is also really, really uh, prominent at Leicester. So the department has always had its kind of uh, finger on the pulse of a lot of the, you know, the major sort of themes, the, the, the cut and thrust of uh, political science and international relations research. And you'll find that when you do the degree. So one of the things you, you get in first year is kind of a very general sort of uh, introductory sense of politics and international relations where we're covering um, a lot of, of ground in, in breadth, but not necessarily in, in as much depth as you will in years two and three. But by the time you get to years two and three, what, what lecturers do is offer their research specialisms as options. So if we have an expert in parliamentary studies, which we do, um, Professor Rick Whitsker, who's, who's actually working with Parliament directly over the next couple of years um, to, to reform their practices and that kind of stuff, you're getting a, a module in parliamentary studies from a world leading expert on that topic. And you might even be getting their ideas on things and their research even before they've published them, because obviously often we, we integrate our research into lectures, into seminars before it even gets published. So, um, you know, in that sense, it's a really, really exciting um, topic to study at, at university because you're, you're getting, um, you know, uh, probably the next 10 to 20 years worth of, of um, uh, politics and IR research before the rest of the world actually gets to see it to, to some extent. Um, so what I would do is, you know, go through the, the list of, of specialisms we have online, go through the lists of um, uh, modules we offer. Um, and you can, if they're in year two and three, you can be almost certain that there's a specialist in that subject teaching it. So we have specialists in Latin American politics. Uh, I work on South Asian politics and political theory. Um, specialists working on feminism and so on. If those are the things on the list that really kind of, you know, um, uh, get your, your mind buzzing about politics and they're the sorts of questions you want to deal with, um, then, then you know, absolutely come to Leicester because we have, you know, some of the world's leading experts on, on those particular topics. Uh, and this is just to run over the, the various ways you can cobble together the course. So there's a lot of options there, so don't let it daunt you too much. But Obviously, BA politics, BA international relations, BA politics and international relations are the kind of core politics offerings that we do on our side of the, the School of um, History and Politics and IR. The others we tend to kind of then um, team up with other subject areas so that students have choice um, in terms of the styles of joint degrees they want to do. But they are subjects that complement each other. So politics and economics is jointly taught with the, the economics department, politics and sociology similarly with the sociology department, and history and politics with our colleagues who are in the same school whether with us on the history side. Um, and basically in all of those joint degrees, it's, it's a perfect 50-50 split. So if every uh, year has 120 credits of modules you, you have to do, 60 will be one subject, 60 will be the, the other subject. Um, and so you get to choose from, from both sides. Um, don't let that sort of um, stress you out too much at this stage if you don't know specifically which combination you want to do or if you just want to do politics, because as uh, you get to university within the two weeks, first two weeks of your term, you have the ability to change to another course, uh, so long as it's within, you know, the, the kind of broad family of um, uh, degrees that are kind of listed there. So you can't do BA politics and change to nursing, obviously, but uh, you can change from BA politics to BA history and politics if you'd, if you'd like. Um, so, yeah, you know, have a think about, you know, what sorts of, um, you know, uh, topics you like to put together, what sort, what sort of interests you have. Um, and also, to a certain extent, you know, what perhaps what sort of job would you like to do? So if you like a job in kind of NGOs and charities and, and the international sphere or the UN or something like that, obviously it makes sense to do um, either straight international relations or pair it up with, with something else. Uh, if you have a very business attitude towards what you want to do with your politics degree, 
politics and economics makes a, a certain degree of sense. Um, the only proviso with politics and economics is, is that the economic side of it, as you might expect, is quite mathsy um, and requires kind of at least um, GCSE B level math. So if maths isn't your your cup of tea, like it's not my cup of tea, um, I would I would be a bit wary about about that one. But but if it is your if numbers are your thing, then then definitely think about it. Um, the three at the bottom there are not 50 50 split. So they're basically degrees that are run in other departments, but you get to have a small taster of politics if you like. Uh, so law with politics is probably the most popular out of those three. Um, and it, I, bet, I think it only allows you to take one politics module um, in every term of your law degree. So it, it, it's a very small part of what you're actually doing. Really, it's a law degree. Um, but if that is something that, that interests you and you know you, you have aspirations to be a lawyer, then, then certainly you can kind of um, smuggle some politics into that law degree uh, if you'd like. Um, I, I won't go through what, what every single module we have on offer is because um, believe me when I tell you that there is a lot of them. So we, we offer a lot of choice to students. So it's best just to look on the website um, uh, for the modules we offer. But what I will give you is kind of the way they fit together. Um, what I would say is this, is this is currently under review as well. So just to give you a heads up, um, next year, I, I suspect the optionality in year two is actually going up. So I think it's going to three core modules and then five option modules. Um, but the way it stands at the moment is, is like this. So you have four core modules in year one. The reason you have four core modules that you have to do, they're mandatory, is because uh, you don't need a politics A-level to, to study politics or IR with us. So we get a lot of students who've done a range of A-level subjects. They've got the grades they need to, to get in, but haven't really studied politics before. So we need core modules to kind of get everyone up to the same speed in terms of what you then need to, to do year two and year three at, at a good level. Um, and these are things like introduction to politics, which is the module I basically run, um, key concepts, international relations, which kind of does what it says on the tin. You're learning about all that stuff I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the international system as anarchy, the relationship between states, war and peace, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then some kind of critical concepts that might be useful for for critiquing other other academics and other scholars. So, uh, you know, if we start to think about race, what does that do to our assumptions about politics? If we start to think about class, what does that do to our assumptions about politics and so on? So that's what you get in the core the core modules. And then you have four option modules to kind of fill up the rest of the credit. So that's everything from the global Cold War, American politics, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, what then happens in year two and year three is you then get to start to choose the the staff specialisms so the the class sizes shrink quite dramatically by by that point so in one of the specialisms say for the, the sake of argument it was animal rights um in year three that might only have sort of 12 to 15 people per seminar group in it so these are really intimate environments where you, you're getting to you know discuss things directly with an expert in the field uh, not just talk about the content but you know how to tackle an essay um, if you're thinking about doing it as a dissertation topic in year three, you know, what advice can that lecturer give you to to, to um, um, develop your thoughts on that and and so on? That's exactly the same for final year, but the dissertation is the only mandatory element. So that's 10,000 words of you really getting to be your own politics or international relations researcher. Uh, you, you come up with a project, you come up with a series of research questions. Um, you're assigned a supervisor to kind of mentor you through that, help you do it. Um, and then you leave year three really with, you know, what, what would be a kind of journal article length research piece that, you know, is what uh, I do on a kind of um, uh, well, maybe not as often as I'd like to, but on a kind of week to <laughs> weekly basis, uh, researching and writing things and, and publishing them. Um, and this idea that, you know, you've left with a, a kind of piece of work that's making your own contribution to knowledge to, to some extent. It's not just answering an essay question. It's not just kind of evaluating what other academics have said. You've actually become a mini academic for your last year um, of, of, of university study. So it's really, really exciting in that sense. But you're really well supported in doing it. You know, uh, you'll meet kind of fortnightly with your supervisor, discuss where to find information, how to analyze it, uh, what the ethical implications of your research are, all that kind of stuff. So that's the real broad overview. You start with lots of core stuff it gets more optional as you you move through the the degree and um, if you look at the website you'll see just the sheer range of, of options we have from from quite traditional topics to quite um, uh, new and uh, kind of innovative ones that have, have kind of swept through the field in the last few years um, so these again I mean I haven't listed all of them but I've actually uh, the list I put this up here or the list I uh, put up here was for a particular reason it's that it kind of compares what I think people expect from a politics degree with modules that they perhaps don't necessarily expect from a politics degree um, 
So some of the traditional ones, which, you know, are really popular and really interesting and really important, nuclear weapons, Cold War, American politics, parliamentary studies, counterterrorism. You can do all of that at Leicester. You know, if those really, you know, heavy hitting uh, traditional political subjects that are always going to be obviously a part of political considerations um, for obvious reasons are there. But if you're someone who, you know, is, is has been interested in student politics or uh, you've got a kind of you know critical um, uh, mindset about you know, you don't like the way that the world works and you'd like to change it. There's all these these uh, other modules which are are kind of getting you to think critically about politics and and changing our perceptions of the world and even changing you know our methods of changing the world. Um, so things like animal rights, things like migration and refugee crises, which are obviously a big thing at the moment, but are, are set to become even bigger as as climate change happens. Uh, my my third year module on race and political theory. You know what we have all these ideas about democracy, free justice and so on but they've come down to us from a, a several hundred year history in which um, you know just to think about freedom and the American Revolution uh, freedom was conceived in the American Revolution when slavery was completely okay right so has that actually tainted their definition of freedom in some ways and how can we use a sort of um, um, a perspective from marginalized communities to start to work through what freedom would really look like for for everyone or what justice would look like for for everyone. Um, space politics at the bottom there as well, um, really popular at Leicester for obvious reasons, because it's just a cool kind of topic, um, but also because we have the space park at the University of Leicester as well. So my colleague who teaches that has very close um, links with the space park and takes his students there and so on and so forth. So it's a really kind of fun um, experience for students. It's not just uh, classroom based um, and various topics around sexuality and feminism um, and all that kind of stuff as well. So, you know, a really, really wide range of topics and something I'm I'm really proud of our department for doing, because if you if you look at some of our, our, our neighboring universities, they don't actually have quite that level of diversity in the modules there they're offering um, either in terms of geographical diversity or in terms of, of conceptual diversity. So, you know, if that sort of real mix of stuff is what you're interested in, um, you know, do do take a good look at Leicester because I think it's something where uh, we're kind of setting a, um, a good example in recently. Um, the style of learning, I mean, I, I often get questions about this from students who are, are thinking of joining us. I'll, I'll spend some time um, uh, fleshing it out. I think what, what everyone expects is you're going to get lectures, which is, you know, 50 minutes of, of being given information by a lecturer and you're sat down and listening and taking notes. And then, you're, of course, you're going to have seminars or, or tutorials, as they're sometimes called, which um, in, in year one can be 50 minutes. In, in year three, they can be anything from two to three hours uh, with breaks in between. Um, but don't worry, that's not just, you know, the lecture kind of picking people as individuals and saying you tell me something you know about this topic they might invite you to offer your own opinions on a particular topic because you've you know prepared the reading for that week and so on but actually it's much more dynamic and much more fun than that there's an awful lot of group work that goes on there's an awful lot of group presentations that go on um, there's an awful lot of field work that goes on and then you're asked to reflect on your day out. So uh, Rick Whitaker, who's our professor of parliamentary studies, actually takes his third year group to uh, parliament um, in year three. They meet MPs, uh, they go to see the committee rooms and parliament and all that kind of stuff. And then once they're back in the classroom, they reflect on what they've seen, what they've been told um, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very it's an actually really kind of dynamic way of teaching. Um, and the idea really is there is that, you know, some of us benefit from just listening to someone talk. Uh, some of us benefit from from just doing a load of reading and then, you know, sharing it in class. But actually, some of us learn better in group situations. Some of us learn better by actually going out into the world and seeing things. Um, and the idea behind our teaching strategy is that you should get a bit of all of that. In, in your seminars uh, for any given module. So you're all getting a chance to contribute equally. Um, and I think the nice thing about, you know, in not just being hands up and, and answering is that you're getting to know each other. You, you get to know your classmates really, really well. Um, I like to think you will become friends and that builds confidence, that builds kind of rapport where you're, you're happier having debates um, and that kind of thing. And those social skills, those soft skills are really important for the workplace as well. So, you know, you're kind of indirectly preparing yourself for the world of work. Um, in that way. Um, assessment wise, again, I know something students worry about a lot. We we still do have a couple of, um, you know, what we might traditionally call exams um, for a couple of modules. I think at the moment they're still sort of effectively take home exams. They're not um, sort of timed exams. So even, you know, the extent to which they're really exams in the sense that, you know, from A level and GCSE and so on is, is not strictly quite the same. Um, but even those are slowly being phased out for more courseworky uh, styles of, of assessment, more presentation oriented assessments, portfolios, policy briefs, that kind of thing. Something that students can take, you know, a little bit of time over, can get feedback on before they submit it. 
Um, and it's not just a, a test of you know how how well you deal with stress under time conditions. It's a bit more of a chill um, way of, of 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 getting at what you actually understand. And 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 I think it's really important for, because for me, I mean, I did all my university stuff through exams, and really it was a kind of um, regurgitating what you've memorized exercise, which is not quite the same as critical thinking, which is really what we want you to do. Um, so I mean, obviously, get in touch with us if you'd like to know more about that. But but uh, I think you can feel fairly confident that we're we're more or less moving completely away from exams. As a, as a way of assessment and, and are doing much more kind of uh, coursework based um, types of assessment. Um, I mean, I mentioned some of this al already for final year. Um, no compulsory modules other than the dissertation, a very large range of options. Uh, and this is really where the research led um, teaching comes in. Um, and as I said, by this stage, if you're having two hour seminars or three hour seminars for a particular topic, you are getting into a lot of depth. Um, for, for quite specific topics, and that's quite different from our first year modules, which are covering a lot of breadth um, in a single session. Um, so, you know, depending on what you choose, you can kind of leave university as a mini expert in you know, animal rights or nuclear weapons or space politics uh, or whatever it happens to be. Um, if that's you know, linked to a particular type of career you're thinking about doing um, as well, and then add to that the specialism of your dissertation. You're leaving with a lot of in-depth knowledge coupled with a lot of um, you know, quite practical research, writing, uh, oral communication skills, and a lot of confidence um, as well, I have to say. Like, I think our third year students leave uh, brimming with confidence. So it's quite nice to see how they they develop throughout the three years. They they become much, much more um, self-reliant in their kind of, you know, mental skills and self-reliant in their ability to actually speak about what they actually think, which is, you know, really, really important for uh, the world of work once you finally leave university. Um, this is not you know, specifically related to politics and IR, this is the whole university uh, and whatever subject you, you do, but um, I think it's really important to point out because um, you know, uh, I think it's always been very stressful for students to go to university. Uh, you know, you're moving away from home potentially, meeting new people, being thrown into a, you know, a, a slightly different style of academic environment and that kind of thing, being treated as adults you know, and being asked to be self-reliant, which is in itself quite stressful. Um, it's important that you're well supported and I think most universities and especially Leicester are very very conscious of the fact that this must be an absolutely core part of our offering to students and a really core part of the student experience so you will be assigned a personal tutor um, pretty much from the day you step on campus you'll meet them within your first week of being at university um, and then if you're a first year that personal tutor will be in contact with you at least once a week they might not see you once a week but they'll be in contact with you once a week in case you want to see them um, and then we're we're supposed to see you um, several times in a, in a term, uh, either as an individual, as a group. Um, so if it's a group, you might just talk about, you know, how you're generally enjoying university, how you're settling into accommodation, all that kind of stuff. Then if there's something personal you would like to talk to your personal tutor about, you can arrange a one to one meeting in confidence to to discuss, um, you know, whatever issues you might be having. And then there's a whole raft of university support systems to kind of um, uh, support both you and your tutor to, to, to deal with that issue. So it might be a learning disability, might be personal challenges at home, um, could be childcare things, you know, there's lots and lots of uh, well-being and support systems in place and staff um, to, to help students with that, including, of course, counselling uh, and this kind of stuff. So um, I, I think that's the also adding to the, what I said at the beginning about Leicester being kind of a community oriented university. Because you know your lecturers and your tutors and, and, and your friends so well, um, I think it makes the, the, the business of supporting students a lot easier. Um, it's much more difficult to do that if you're in a big city and the university is kind of spread all over the place and you're living half an hour from, from your um, you know, student union and your, where your personal tutor's office is and that kind of stuff. Um, we have a much more kind of, I think, practical um, approach to, to the student experience just by being a campus based um, university. So again, something really to think about um, when, when picking a university, what, what type of experience do you want? There's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to be in the big city and being, you know, kind of um, a small fish in a very big pond. That's that's totally OK, but you do need to make a conscious decision about that, not, not just kind of um, go blindly into it. Uh, employability is obviously very important because you know most of you are not um, probably very wisely hoping to be academics like me um, and just uh, studying forever and ever and ever. Um, as I said at the beginning, your know, politics and I are very very open ended. I think what I always say about it is um, it, it leaves a lot of doors open. So I appreciate most of you aren't hoping to become MPs, but if you are, I mean, great. Um, you know, we have students that go into law, we have students who go into the civil service, we have students who become teachers, students who work for charities, students who set up their own businesses, all this kind of stuff, um, you know, that that's, uh, employers are looking for 
um, when they see you know politics or IR or a combination of you know politics, history, economics, so on, um, on a CV, they know these are the sorts of skills you're coming away with, and they want to to hire you for that kind of stuff. Um, you can see the the statistic there: ninety four percent of our graduates are employed or in further education after six months. Um, so really, you know, really good proportion of our students um, going into further study or, or, or employment. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I, I, I'm always really interested to hear what our students are doing because it surprises me sometimes even what the sorts of things that they they get into. So I, I had a student a few years ago who did a politics BA and then did an MA in what must have been something healthcare related um, and is now working in perioperative care. So, I, you know, I've no idea how that links up with originally doing a politics in uh, a degree in politics and IR. But clearly, you know, the um, given the fact that his MA would have had fairly stringent entrance requirements about what it takes to get onto that. Um, MA program. The fact that he did politics and IR, the fact that he got a good grade in it, opened the door for him then to do quite a, an advanced degree in, in healthcare. So passion and, 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 and being good at a subject that you're going to get a good degree classification in is, is sometimes as important as thinking directly about, you know, well, is this degree directly related to a job I, I want to do? Um, or you may not have a clue what job you want to do. Um, getting that 2-1 or first is a really, you know, important thing to be able to do. And there are some subjects we're just better at than others, right? So if politics and IR is that thing you're passionate about that you know will sustain your interest for three years, then then take a really serious look at it because short of wanting to be a, a you know a heart surgeon or an engineer, um, it pretty much keeps most doors open. Um, I've mentioned this already as well, but you can see the picture there for field trips. That's actually this year's parliamentary studies group who went with um, Richard Whitaker to Parliament and they had a really, uh, my office is kind of uh, opposite Richard's as well. So when, when I hear them coming to talk to him about the um, the trip, you can you can actually hear through the walls how juiced up they are about it. They're really excited. So I mean, it's one of those things that I think is really great, not just for understanding how Parliament works, but um, it's just such a fantastic way for students to get to know each other better and, and to have a really sort of positive experience on uh, university campuses. So that's the main one we've been running for a few years. I know the new animal rights module that's running in year three, um, my colleague Steve Cook, he's actually got a very close relationship with a local zoo in the Midlands. So he's taking his students there to, to talk about animal rights and talk to the, the people to work there about animal rights and, and you know what they think about it and so on. Um, my third year module may be taking students, um, it's still in the works at the moment, but um, taking students to the International Slavery Museum because I work on, on race and political theory. So you're know, really understanding how slavery has sort of um, affected uh, certainly American politics, but, but even British politics um, and whether we need to think about ideas of justice in, in various different ways based on what we've seen in the museum. Um, uh, in the classroom. So yeah, lo you know, lots and lots of fun, really kind of hands on teaching experiences that aren't just about, uh, you know, reading books and, and talking in, in class. Um, I'll run through this very briefly because we are we are uh, slightly running out of time, but we do also have a study abroad option and you, what you can see there are uh, the bullet points of places where we have very uh, formal relationships with other institutions that you can spend some time at uh, if you would like to. So uh, we have a, a study abroad kind of team that, that um, you know, will help you organise that kind of stuff. We have a study abroad tutor in the School of History and Politics and IR who's your kind of go to person for, for organising this kind of stuff. Um, but as you can see, some some really cool places and I, I tend to to find that students who do this um, often come back with the, the sort of most positive attitude towards completing their degree and actually graduate with a um, usually quite good honours degree um, by the end of it. So it, it can be a really kind of um, you know intellectually um, expansive experience and just you know seeing the world and, and kind of um, uh, a nice way to, to, to add to your university experience that you know makes you a mature postgraduate by, by the end of it. Right, well with that I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully you do have some questions um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks Vic. Um, there is still time for people to add some questions so please do in the Q&A. Um, we did have one question you mentioned on the the um, the first year in particular you mentioned about kind of studying breadth of subject mm -hmm. rather than depth. Um, so I guess it's kind of linked to that. Can you tell us any more about what maybe um, a day in the life looks like for a first year um, or maybe actually what a week looks like? Yeah, so it's a really good question because I think students are often um, you know, worried that they're kind of in university nine to five every day and will it, will it be a kind of you know, um, massive burden compared to their, their usual style of study. Um, just to take so the, the introductory po uh, politics module I do in year one, which is called Introduction to Politics. It has two lectures and one seminar per week. So that's 
uh, uh, one hour lecture on Monday, one hour lecture on Tuesday, and the, depending where it's timetabled, a one hour seminar at some point in the week. So you're really only doing three hours for that particular 30 credit module. You'll have another 30 credit module in, in term one, which will also be three hours. And that's all you've got for term one effectively. And then term two, you will do two more 30 credit modules that'll add up to um, six hours. So six hours a week is not, you know, that onerous really in terms of, of contact time. And the idea there is, of course, that when you're not in class, we've given you prep to do outside of it. You're, you should be kind of getting to grips with the reading um, and you have kind of reading lists that we we give to you and, and core reading that we, we flag up and suggest you read before class so we can discuss it. I, I mean, it depends on what lecture you have, but I tend to mix it up as well. So I often like to set podcasts um, that might be about politics for students to listen to. Um, because a lot of academics do make podcasts now and it's quite good just to get kind of um, discussion going. Often I, I often set documentaries instead of reading as well because I like that to be discussed. I actually use quite a lot of film in political theory as well. I like sort of because films are actually always very political even when they're not trying to be. Um, and it's a good way to get students to engage and then deconstruct what's you know what's going on in uh, this particular um, movie that reflects our current politics, even if the director didn't really intend it. Um, so it's a, it's a very diverse kind of, you know, teaching experience, but but you're not going to be kind of, you know, asked to be in 40 hours a week, uh, put it that way. It's, it's not a kind of nine to five job thing. Uh, all we say is, you know, when you're not in class and we ask you to do some prep that you do do it, because otherwise you're going to uh, come to class being a bit sort of flummoxed and, and not able to participate. But but other than that, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's easing you into university life. It's not it's not really not trying to bury you under work. Thanks, Vikram. I think uh, I think the whistle people um, are sure to, to hear that. Um, there is still time if anybody wants to put any other questions into the, the Q&A while we have Vikram. Um, so I'll give you a couple more minutes for that. There was just another Vic and that was the, the only other one. Um, so that was if you could tell us a little bit more about assessment. Um, so is it very heavy exam focus? Is it a range? Um, could you could you tell us any more about that? Yeah, so I mean, as I was saying, we, we there are a couple of modules that still do have take home exams, so they're not they're not timed in a hall like A levels. There, you take them home. Um, in in that sense, they're open book as well. So um, you're supposed to do them under sort of more or less time conditions. You, it's released to you, you know, like the day before, so you don't have weeks and weeks and weeks to kind of do it, and then you hand it in. Um, you know, when when the deadline is. But I have to say, even those, because we're undergoing a big curriculum reform at the moment, are, are falling out of favour. Um, uh, and things that are being substituted in are, are things like coursework. So you're given the questions right at the very beginning of the module. And then when that essay is actually due in, will be sort of, you know, four or five weeks into the module. So you've had a good four or five weeks to start thinking about the question, asking your module tutor about potential reading, maybe sending them an essay plan, all that kind of stuff um, before you actually have to sit down and write it in your own time. So I think it's a much more it's a much more relaxed way of doing assessments, which I, I think is not putting you know too much pressure on students to uh, and, and anxiety on students. But through being relaxed, I think it's actually getting at what students really think. You know, the whole point is you should have a time to understand what we've given you, deconstruct it, bring your own ideas to it, find a logical argument and evidence to support it, and then present us with the best possible work you're capable of, rather than stressing people out in the exam hall and saying, you know, just just regurgitate what you can in, in two hours, which seems to me rather strange way of, of testing um, students, even though we've been doing it for like 100 plus years in this country for some reason. Um, so all that kind of stuff and then practical skill stuff as well. So there might be assessed presentations, which are a little bit more stressful because you have to speak in front of someone, but preparing you very, very well for the sorts of thing you'll be doing outside of university. Um, and I find usually once students are kind of comfortable with their peers, they actually really enjoy it. You know, it can be quite a fun activity because you get a to and fro between you and your, your peers in class. Um, you know, you can um, even make presentations entertaining and funny. You know, that's part of getting information across, being kind of um, worth watching uh, and that kind of thing. So I, I've always found they become very, very, um, you know, pleasant activities. But of course, there are measures in place that if you really suffer from extreme social anxiety, you, you can do the presentation just to, you know, say me or someone and other people don't have to be there and so on. Um, but usually we try to get people to sort of, you know, do it in a classroom environment. Thanks, Vic. Thanks. That's that's really interesting. Um, there aren't any more questions uh, on the um, Q&A at the moment. Um, there were a couple of, of very specific questions about entry requirements and, and a couple about master's level. So I've replied to those privately. Right. Um, so um, if anyone um, needs to follow up, um, I, I've put the um, the email address into the into the chat as well. Um, but I think other than kind of a very last call for last questions, 
um, I think we might be uh, I think we might be wrapping up Rickham. Brilliant. Well, thank you much, Victoria. And thank you very much for coming. Um, it's really been really nice speaking to you all.